Good morning, you guys. God bless you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Celia. All right. How's everybody doing? Has everybody had enough sun the last week or so? We're going to get some more in the last couple of days. Thank God for swimming pools and water slides. I want to get a water slide. All right. Today we're going to be in uh, John 3.16. John 3.16 in, 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 in context. You know, Pastor Marco taught on this. He's been in John for a while, so we've been going through it. I talked to Pastor Marco, I don't know, a little over a week ago and was like, what can we teach? He's like, let's get, let's, let's zero in on something in John. He's like, so much things that he missed that he wanted to, you know, he only got so much time to really get into it. So we're going to take a closer look at John 3.16 today because it's, it, it's the most known uh, verse, I think. It's probably the most known verse, whether we have it memorized or we just know, we know seeing it. Um, there was this man, uh, Brother Martin was reminding me about this man named Roland Stewart. Has anybody ever heard of Roland Stewart? The Rainbow Man? Okay, I didn't know either until my brother Martin was telling me about him this morning. Roland Stewart, he was the guy who used to go to all this, the athletic games, all the sports games, and he'd wear a, a, a rainbow in events, big events. And he'd wear 70s and 80s, he'd wear a, a rainbow afro, and he would have John 316. And you'd see him on the screens and see him on the TVs. And he started that trend of, of being at, 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 you know, football games. And I remember, I remember, you know, growing up watching the football games on TV, when they kick a field goal, you'd see somebody in the background, John 316. So that was Roland Stewart. Roland Stewart started that off right there. He started, he, he would wear a, a, a white shirt and he'd have John 316 in it and he'd wear, uh, and that was his way of evangelizing. That was his way of, of, of getting out there, which is, um, which is awesome. It, it's, it's, you know, people like him are, are, they can encourage others to go out there and share the thing. And he has encouraged others because he stopped in the, in the eighties, I believe doing it. But I know going on through the 90s, and I'm not sure even now, but um, you would see people with the John 316. Um, so the whole world, and especially if it's televised, would see John 316. The only issue I have with that is it's a Bible verse that's, that's um, out of context. If you just read one verse, you kind of take it out of context, and you forget the verses that are before it, the verses that are after it. And so you just read that verse, and you're kind of like, okay, th- that's... The only idea of God you have, especially if that's the only verse that you ever read or ever think about or ever know. A um, lot going on in that verse and in the context around it in that whole chapter of John um, with Nicodemus, the conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus. Uh, but uh, yeah, Roland Stewart, he, he, he did that, which is awesome. God used him. Great. That's it. Um, now, the sad part of the story is Roland Stewart, as, 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 as much as God used him and he, to to share John 3.16, share John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Whoever believes in him, whoever goes on believing him. Unfortunately, Roland Stewart is now in prison, so he actually turned a, 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 a turn. You know, he did a, he did a U-turn, right? And he, he got into some things and some crimes and some sin, right? And he didn't go on. You know, he didn't go on. And I, I don't really know where he's at today. You know, a lot of people, there's ministries in prisons, and there's great ministries in prisons. There's prison ministry, and, and, and it's great. I mean, so I pray that that's, you know, he, he's learned from his mistakes and that he's following the Lord even in prison, even in prison. But that's suffice to say that, that that's where he's at today. So uh, like I said, I'm not sure where he is spiritually. I know where he is physically, but I pray that he, he, he does get back. That's Roland Stewart, so... Really focused on John 3.16. God used it. Awesome. Like I said, I'm going to read it in context here. And uh, Brother Martin did a good job reading it earlier. So I'm going to read it here. I'm going to start in, in, in uh, verse 14 of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 3. I should turn on my timer here. So, Okay. John, chapter 3, starting in verse 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. 
For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe in him has been judged already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested and having been wrought in God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we come before you in the name of Jesus. And it's because of him that we're all here today, Lord God, or at least I hope It's because of him that we're all here today, Lord God. Thank you for your grace and mercy, Lord God. We need more grace and we need more mercy, Lord God. Forgive us, Lord God, our trespasses, Lord God. Thank you for sending your son to die, Lord God. And thank you, Jesus, for taking your life up again. Thank you, Jesus, for the offer of eternal life, Lord God. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for giving him to us, Lord God, so that we would learn, so that he would lead us into all truth, Lord God. Would you help us? Would you help lead us into all truth, Lord God? Would you teach us today, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, your word? Would you help us to grow more to know you, Lord God, more to understand what you did on that cross, Lord God, more to love you, more to love each other, Lord God? Would you help us to show us what it means, Lord God, what that love meant to you, Lord God? what it means for us, Lord God. Would you help us? Give us eyes to see and ears to hear, Lord God. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, once again, John 3.16. We're zeroing in. We're taking a closer look at John 3.16. My dad's going to be helping me out today with the the images. So, um, bear with us. If it gets kind of off, just... So a few things about John 3.16 and kind of taking it out of context. It says, for God so loved the world. So loved the world. Is it, is it so loved? So loved. So a lot of times when you look at that, if you take it out of context in that way, you're like, oh, God loves me so much. So much. And, that, and that's not exactly what it says. So we're going to take a, a closer look at what it means. A few things about God loving us so much about the love of God. A few things about the love of God I, I want to point out. And um, I'm still searching these things. I'm looking these things. I'm finding these things, all right? Some of these things I'm going to speak about as, as, um, as I'm studying and encouraging you and challenging you to, to, to check it out yourselves. Like, don't take things that I say, you know, uh, be a good Berean, the Bible says. You know, ch- check, check everything that I say with the word of God. Make sure, do your own study in the word of God. Don't ever just listen to a pastor and be spoon-fed and just be like, hey, I'm going to take it. Like, it's just, no, I'm not the final authority. God's the final authority. His word is the final authority. So go and look at his word and check it out for yourself. A few things about the love of God. So when you actually look into the love of God, when you, when you look at the Bible describing, talking about, defining a the love of God. What's like? What's the love of God? What, what's the love of God all about? If you really do your, to your, your your study, really research it. I mean, Google it even. I mean, you could find. Now, there's compared to how many? You guys, anybody know how many verses are in the Bible? I mean, tons, right? Like thirty-five thousand verses in the Bible, right? Thirty-five thousand. Once again, from what I've studied, thirty-five thousand verses in the Bible. And compared to that, in relation to that, there's very few verses, compared to 35,000, um, that directly or explicitly describe the love of God. Describe the love of God. Very few. There's things that we could say, wow, he did that. Wow, he did this. Wow, that's, 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 that's loving, right? But then sometimes it's like, well, what is loving? We're going to look a little deeper at love, at what the Bible talks about love, especially in that, as it relates to John 3.16. Of all the verses that, that do talk about Love. I, I've heard it said 35. I've heard it said 35. I looked into it, and I kind of I think I found more than that. But I've I've heard it I've I've heard it said there's about 35 that, like I said, that directly or explicitly refer to the love of God. So um, compared to 35,000 verses, okay. 
all those verses that you read about the love of God, it, it, it's, to, it's, it's written to those who have been redeemed, who have been redeemed from, from slavery in either Egypt in the Old Testament, you know, the, the Israelites' delivery from Egypt, the love for, you know, the, the people of Israel getting delivered out of slavery in Egypt under Pharaoh, um, or slavery to those who have been redeemed or delivered from slavery to sin under Satan, obviously, right? He's the God of this world. I've been delivering him. So these verses that they, the, the, the few verses that we do have on God's love, and it's and you have and, and it's like I think one of the reasons is because, and I think that as you walk with the Lord, as you get closer to the Lord, you understand more of the love of God. As you go walk in the light, you understand more of the love of God. And as that, like we just read in John, as you get closer to the light, it exposes more of your darkness. And now you have something to compare it to. And you're able to see, wow, the depth of that, the depth of God's love. You're able to understand it more because the light, you're close to him, it shines more on how much we didn't deserve what he did for us. You, you see what I'm saying? It's like you get closer to him, we're able to see. Now, the problem with just saying, speaking about the love is we have the wrong idea of love, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, we were looking at some scriptures. A couple, we talked about a couple of scriptures yesterday at New Creation Ministry about some of the times where, where, where there are talking about the love of God, and, and we noticed that Jesus and his apostles, when they were talking about God's love, it was, it was to each other. The Jews, they were talking to each other. In the Old Testament, they were talking to each other. Um, prophets were talking to the Jewish people. It was always God's people, God's people. Jesus and the apostles, and you could check me out. You could do, please do, do your own research. Uh, check the scriptures. Jesus or his apostles, they never preached about love, the love of God, to the unbelieving public, to those who didn't believe because they just they didn't do it. So you look for it. Why is that? Why didn't they preach to the, can anybody, like, why? Why didn't they, once again, I don't think they could understand the kind of love that God has for his people. I don't think they can understand. What, what do you compare it to? Um, I think some of it has to do with um, casting pearls. Jesus talked about casting pearls, casting pearls before swine. He says, if you do that, if you give some of these, these great truths that God, Jesus, saved for his people, for his followers, um, for his followers, if you, if you share them with those who don't, aren't, aren't ready to hear them, it says that the pearls will turn and attack you. An example of that is if you just tell someone Jesus loves you, I mean, if you've experienced death in your family, if you've experienced, experienced a loved one and you don't know God, you don't know about God's love, and you, someone tells you Jesus loves you, and you just, you know, grandma just died of cancer, one of the first things you're going to say is, really, God loves me that much? My grandma just died of cancer. I have cancer right now. Jesus really loves me? And, you know, these casting your pearls, or they'll, they'll, they'll turn on you. They'll turn on you. Um, how can an all-loving God send someone to hell? If God loves me so much. Why would he send anybody? If God loves like that, why would he send people to hell? I just don't believe. And then hell, the doctrine of hell goes thrown out the window. There's just no hell. There's no hell because how can an all-loving God do that? How can all, and then it's like, well, where does, where does the, 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 the Bible say that God is only loving? Right? Because God has attributes. And you read about his attributes. He's a God of mercy. He's a God of justice. He's a fair God. Right? But when it's only focusing in on T-shirt, sign, John 3, 16, it becomes the message. This becomes the message. God, and, it, and, if, it's, and if it's wrongly um, interpreted, that verse, it's like, God loves you so much. God loves you so much. And it's like, oh, man, you mean just as I am? You mean just as I am? Okay. So Jesus never taught like that. The apostles never taught like that. You won't find... Jesus going around telling people, you know, I love you. I love you. Did he, you read John 3, 16. What did Jesus do as proof of his love? He died, right? What did God do, right? He gave his son. Love is an action, and we're going to see that a little bit more. There's more to it than that. So we're going to take a closer look at it today. Um, another thing that Jesus never taught was, was about, about God being everybody's father, about God's being everybody's 
everybody's father. He's, he's your father. He talked about being a child of God, being children of God, walking, getting God walking you into his family. He didn't talk about that to, to the unbelieving world. So we say, well, what about God's unconditional love? What about his unconditional love? I believe that we... So Jesus died for us. His grace was offered to us unconditionally, absolutely. Absolutely. Whether you're a man, whether you're a woman, whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're Hispanic, whatever you are, it's, it's Jesus died for you, right? He, he showed no partiality in that. No, yes, unconditionally died for you, right? But the Bible doesn't talk about unconditional love. Like, you won't find unconditional love in there. Because if it was an unconditional love, then it'd be like, well, then everybody's a child of God because he loves me unconditionally, right? John 3.16 wouldn't say, well, you have to believe. It's unconditional, right? What if I don't? You still love me unconditionally? Well, no, this is what God did unconditionally, is he died for the sins of the whole world, the sins of the whole world. That's what he did. He died for the sins of the whole world. You hear unconditional love, what do you think of? Hey, he loves me just as I am. You hear that, come as you are. You hear there's no judgment, right? He loves me unconditionally. And we're going to you hear that. You hear that over and over again. He loves me unconditionally no matter what. And it, 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 it begs the question, is that the way we're supposed to stay? If God loves us unconditionally that way, then why does he change us? Then why does he change us? There would be no need for repentance if he loves us just as we are. You don't need to. He just loves you just as you are, Right? We hear about God's love. We overemphasize God's love so much to those who can't understand. They can't even begin to understand the love of God of what he did, the, the magnitude of what he did. And this isn't something that we just, all of a sudden, you become a Christian and you understand everything. No. New believer, start reading your Bible. Get in the Gospels, right? Get in the Gospel of John. That's what we tell new believers. Because I believe, I believe the Gospel of John was written to believers. I believe there are a couple of Gospels that are more written to, to unbelievers, but I believe the Gospel of John was written to believers so we would know more about who Jesus is, more about his deity, right? More about his love. You can understand it more. So you got a new believer. Get the Gospel of John. Get in the Gospel of John, and then we'll do that. And, and that's what I... Lost my train of thought. So God loves, absolutely. Does God hate? Does God hate? Absolutely, right? We say, well, God hates sin, Right? Well, we're not going to go there, but if you go to the Proverbs and read about, the, the, about God hating you, it's like, he just hates the sin, right? Loves the sin and hates the sin. Read Proverbs. He says he hates the hands. He hates those hands that shed innocent blood. He says he hates the feet that run towards evil. So it's, 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 he doesn't just hate the, he hates those hands that do it. So you see, the, I think that the problem with, with the world is that, God came into the world to save the world, but then he made disciples, and he said, now go and do what I did. I'm going to go away. I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit. I'm going to say, go everywhere and evangelize and go tell people about me, right? Do it like I did it. Be a disciple. Follow me. So we have to look to see how did Jesus do it? How did the apostles do it? And so on for centuries and centuries. But we've been so far removed from that. Now the gospel becomes Jesus loves you, and that's not the way Jesus preached. It's not the way the apostles preached. And so now we get a whole church that doesn't tell anybody about God's righteousness, about sin, and we're just, Jesus loves you as you are, and that's it. And it's like, how many people do you know that just say, hey, like in in living in sin, um, just back and forth between sin and church and things like that, and it's like, it doesn't matter, Jesus loves me just as I am, and it never changes. Jesus loves me just as I am, and that's... and, and. is there condemnation for those who don't believe? We just read it. There is condemnation for those who believe. But if God loves us unconditionally, absolutely no, then why would that verse would not even be there. There would No, there's no condemnation. He loves me just as I am. See, what I'm trying to get at here is, is a different way of looking at how we're supposed to be reaching the lost, of how Jesus did it, how the apostles did it. We know the world knows. That. The world, that's the first thing they know about God. Hey, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. It's like, yeah, he did. This is how he loved you. We're going to get there. But how about God loves those who fear him? How about God loves those who keep his commandments? 
So let's look at John 3, 16, and then we'll break it up a little bit. I don't know Greek. I don't know Spanish. Some of you do know Spanish and English. You guys know that when you're trying to translate something, it's difficult, right? When you're trying to translate something into English from Spanish, like write it out for somebody, right? Trying to, our translators who do our, our Devor Espanol, they have a difficult time translating things. Maybe not as difficult anymore with the computer technology and all that, but yes, it's to try to get things across. You guys know that some of, your, some of the, the sayings in Spanish, they just don't come out, come out right in English, right? You're like You might tell a joke in Spanish, and, and then I'll be the type of guy who's like, can you just tell me what it says in English? And it's like, it's not, it's not funny. You tell me in English, I'm like, that's not funny. And then, you know, you know my father-in-law, my dad, I'll be like, yeah, it sounds different in Spanish though, right? It sounds different in Spanish. But if you, ha- if you be fortunate enough to be bilingual, then you get it both ways. You're like, oh, okay, you have it even more. So it's okay. We could study that if you really want to study Spanish. Like right now, I'm trying to work on it a little bit. Why don't we have some mission trips planned down south? So yeah, we should, you know, work on that. If you want to look, learn a little bit more about the Bible, you have to know that it wasn't written in English, right? It wasn't written in English. Written in Greek, or New Testament, written in Greek. So it's okay to look into some of those things. Do you have to know Greek to be saved? Absolutely not. You need to repent of your sins and trust in Jesus to be saved, okay? But if you want to really look into it and get to know the scriptures, it opens it up to you. It gets you to know more about what God, what, what God um, I guess, requires of us, what God wants from us, what it means to obey God, you know, because you look a little deeper into it and it just, so you look into the Greek a little bit if you want, you could. We're going to look at it a little bit. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. Subject there is God, obviously. God, okay? Um, Let's see. You know what? God the Father, right? He's not talking about Jesus or Talking about God the Father, right? That's, that's an easy one, right? That's God the Father, right? He gave up his son. So God the Father. God the Father, the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible. No other God did this. This is what distinguishes Christianity from all other, from all other religions, is that our God gave up his son. Our God gave up his son for us, right? He gave up his son for the world. So God, God the Father. I'm not going to... Um, Next one, next important thing is love. Let's just tackle loved right now. Loved, okay? Loved. So the, the Greeks had like four, basically four different words for love, okay? We have loved, but it's written in the Bible different ways. So the first one I'm going to talk about, the Greek word for loved is, is I can barely even pronounce it, epithumia, epithumia, okay? It's best translated Lust, okay? Lust for English, okay? This is the lust. This is something that Christians should have nothing to do with. This is something that we shouldn't have to do. We shouldn't have lust. It's, it's greedy. It's craving. It, it, it looks after ourselves, number one. It just wants what, what we want. It's greedy. It's a greedy kind of love. The Greeks, right? They had that word. For, that was love for them. It was a Greek word, love. We translated in English as lust, okay? We should have nothing to do with that. It's one-sided. It only looks out for ourselves. It only wants what satisfies us and, des- and our desires. It, it, we should have nothing to do with that form of love right there, okay? The next word is eros, another word, Greek word for, for love, eros. And the Bible translates, tra- translates this in different ways, love. Eros. Eros is the love of attraction, right? Based off of Greek gods and things like that, eros. You might have heard of like Cupid, things like that. That's based off of basically eros, right? Um, so it's the love of attraction. It's not necessarily an evil. It's, this is something that two people need to have for each other, right? A man and a woman have an attraction for each other, right? It, it, it's nothing evil about that, um, inherently evil, okay? It's like attractive. We're attractive to each other, okay? We're attracted to each other. People are attracted to each other. Um, fall in love, right? You be attracted to each other, then you fall in love, right? And then you get married, hopefully, that's Eros, okay? You hear about how many songs are there about love? About love. Uh, so many love songs, right? We know so many, we love so many love songs. The majority of the love songs that we hear are Eros. It's Eros. It's about this attraction for one another, this attraction that they have. Oh, my attraction for I'm so I'm so in love with you. Attraction. So is God's love Eros? No. Does, does John use the word Eros? No, he doesn't use it. It's a really popular word. It's a really most used word, I think. Um, but he doesn't use that word. He doesn't use, is there anything particularly attractive about us to God? 
Can anybody raise their hand if they think that they're particularly something attractive about them to God? Like he's just attracted to me? Okay, that's good. Philia, that's the next one. Philia, okay. We get, um, it's like a brotherly love. It's basically like. Like if you guys remember the story when Jesus said, do you agape me? Do you love me to Peter? And Peter's like, I like you. I like you. You know, he, 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 that was as far as he can get. He, get. he grew in his understanding, right? He grew to lo- love more. Brotherly love. We get Philadelphia from it. Philia. We get Philo, the city of brotherly love, right? We get brotherly love, which is a great love as well. It's a great love the Greeks had, a word for it. Philia. It's used in the Bible. Like. We like. We have things in common with each other, some more than others. The ones we have more in common with, we like them more. The ones we don't, not so much, right? Not so much. Um, we like who we like, right? So it only goes so far, right? It's like, it's back to that, what do I get? Well, you're in, we have things in common. We have a great conversation. I'm getting something. You're getting something. We like each other. Philia, right? We got that, that brotherly love for each other. Okay? Now we're going to come to the word that John did use, agape. You guys have heard about agape before. Uh, two things about agape. This is the only image I could find. Agape, a word for agape, I think, would be close to say is care. Care. Our word Care. When you're a caretaker, when you're a caretaker for someone, is you do something for them, right? A caretaker does something for someone. To care for somebody isn't a feeling, right? You're caring for them. You're doing something. Agape is a love of action. A love of action. You see something, you see a need, and you do something about it. That's agape. It's an action. It's a love of action, right? Remember when Jesus is telling the parable about the Good Samaritan? And he said, who loved his neighbor more, right? Who loved? There was three people who passed by, right? There was somebody who was going by. He got mugged. He got mugged. He got beaten up. Three people passed by. They all had a feeling. They all felt bad. They all had a feeling for this person like, oh, man, oh, that's horrible. That's horrible. But there was only one person who agape. It was the person. What person was that? It was the Samaritan, right? What did he do? He did something about it. He did something for that person. He took him, cleaned him up, took him to his house. Remember that? Took him, was it his house or to an inn? An inn. He did something. See, yeah, that was, it says, this is, this is the one who agape. This is the one who agape his neighbor. The one who saw a need, saw something happen, and did something about it. That's what agape means. That's what agape means, doing something. Doing something. And that's what he says here that, that God did. He did something. See, see that? It's not that he is so attracted to us, right? It's not that he likes us so, so much. It's not that. It's that he saw a need. God saw a need, and he did something about it. He agape right? Agape is, is, is centered in the will. It's not centered in the heart, not centered in the feeling. It's centered in our will, right? So it can be commanded. That's why we're commanded to agape one another. We're commanded. Let me explain. Can you command two young people? Can you can't, you know, they don't have to be young even, but can you command two young people to, to eros each other? To eros each other. Remember what I said, the, tra- the love of attraction. Absolutely not. You're either attracted to someone or you're not. You either fall in love with someone or you don't. Can you command someone to eros someone? No, you can't. Can you command someone to phileo somebody? I would say no. You could tell them to. But is somebody going to be able to do that if it's a matter of will? If I either like somebody or you don't like somebody. You either like somebody. But agape, you can command agape because it's action. It's doing something. It's meeting a need. It's meeting a need. Whether you like them, whether you're attracted to them, you could still agape someone. You could still love somebody. Whether you could still love somebody. And I hate to use this reference, but what about marriage? Do you always have Cupid? Do you always feel like you got hit by Cupid in marriage? Right? That's the way it started. You were attracted. You fell in love. You like, you had a common interest. Wow, you hit it off. You had this long four or five hour conversations on the phone, or you'd fall asleep each other, you know, fall asleep with each other, or not with each other, but on the phone talking to each other. Right? But then you get married and you're told to love through through sickness, through health. Good times and bad times, you're told to love each other, to keep loving each other. It's, it's an action. It's doing something, meeting a need. God agapied the world. He saw a need, and he did something about it. He saw a need, and he took action. He did something one time. 
John 3, 16. This is an explanation. We're going to read it in context in a minute. God actually did something. He did something for the world. He agape the world. World. Now, we think a world, or like, oh, that's the world. We're told, you know, John, in a letter that he writes, because he wrote the gospel, he also wrote a letter. It says not to love the world. Not to love the world or the things in the world. But here it says that God loved the world. So what is this what world? What are you talking about? Well, world here is like, oh, the, the, the earth. We can think of, oh, of the whole world, you know. Obviously, it's talking about people here, right? It's talking about people, but not just people. What about people? He loved people. People, when we think about uh, the world, like, oh, man, don't love the world, we think about the, the, the system of the world, the, wor- the world's philosophies, the things of the world, the things that the world values that God doesn't value. We think of that, right? That's what, what comes to mind, right? When, when comes, when, before the Lord, that's all we were consumed with was things of the world. But God agapied the world so much, he saw such a need in the world that he did something about it. The world here is it's a big word. It's the world. It's everybody in the world, right? But it's a bad word also. It's it's like the rebellious world, the sinful world, the fallen world, all the fun. God agape the whole rebellious, sinful world. So it's you're looking a little more into it. You know, it's like he, he this is God. He he valued the world. He looked at the world. The rebellious world, or he agapied the world, I should say. God agapied a rebellious and sinful world. It doesn't stop there. He did something about it. So we're just going to go, go through this. Begotten. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Some of these I'll go through real quick. Begotten, not made, as a um, lot of religions, false religions, will tell you that God was born. He was, he was, he was made. He's begotten, not made. You know, Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe that he was begotten. They believe that he was made. They say begotten, you know, beget. See, he was born. He was, no, no, this is not, this is unique. This word more more is like one and only. His begotten, his one and only, his natural. All of us through faith are adopted. We're adopted into the family of God, right? But there's only one who's his natural son, who's always been his son. That's Jesus. Unique, one and only. The rest of us have been adopted. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you've been adopted. He gave. He gave that. He gave. A word gave right there. He gave us his son. It was a gift. He gave it to us. Free gift. It was a free gift. He gave us this. He gave us. The father gave us his son. Did you do anything to earn it? Absolutely not. We were rebellious. We were sinful. And he gave you his son. That's what he did. He gave. And I would say in life and in death, he gave us his son. When he was born, it was like joy to the world, right? Savior's born. Here he is, right? And he gave him in death. It talks about here in John three sixteen. Whoever, whoever, uh, I think a better translation of that would be everyone. Everyone. It doesn't make much of a difference, but it's everyone. Whoever. Because you think, once again, it's like, oh, whoever, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't even matter you know, what I do, who I am. But it's like, no, everyone, everyone, what? Everyone that believes in him, that believes in him. A couple of things about it, believes. And you guys have heard this. Pastor Marco taught on everything that I'm teaching here. Pastor Marco taught on. You know, he taught on not everything, but majority. I'm just taking a closer look at here because he went over the whole chapter. I'm taking a closer look at this about believes, okay? Because this is really important, believes. Once again, the... The Greek, right? The Greek, the grammar, the tense, that word belief right there. The thing about the belief in the Greek right there, it, it's, it, it's called the present particle. You guys could look it up. You guys could look a little bit into it, the grammar of Greek grammar and things like that. I don't know a lot about it, but I've looked into it because I want to know more about what this means right here to really believe, right? To believe. It's, it's, it's saying it's continuous right here. It's go on believing. That's what that word right there is. Like, believing, like keep believing, Go on believing. And the word believe is better translated trust, trusting, obeying, right? It says that whoever would believe, whoever believes in him, believes in. That's a big word, right? That's the second thing. The first thing is the tense, the the grammar of it, continuous, going on believing. That next word is in right there, believes in. Not just believes that. 
How many people just believe that Jesus existed? A lot of people believe that Jesus existed. A lot of people believe that he died. But here it says, whoever believes in, whoever believes in, in. That's a big difference. I could ask you this. If, do you believe I am who I say I am? Like, raise your hand if you believe I am who I say I am. My name's Anthony. I'm married. I have kids. You believe that? You guys believe that? How many of you believe in me? How many of you believe, how many of you would trust me and obey me? You know, if I said, hey, man, you know, you know I, I do look out for, I really do look out for your, I try to look out for your best interests. If I seen, you know, you know, maybe you have cirrhosis of the liver and I see you drinking and I see you getting drunk, I'm going to say, hey, man, you know, believe me, man, you're going to die. Would you believe in that? Do you, you trust me? Would you obey that and stop drinking? See, the difference is believe, you believe that something, but you don't believe in me. Anybody raise their hand that believes in me? Nobody? Oh, man. <laughs> Come on. Believe. Don't believe me. Believe God. Okay. We got one, one hand in the back right here. Believe. Let me hold your wallet for the rest of the day, and I'll tell you where you should spend it. That's the thing. Trust me enough to, to let me have the, your account number. Trust me enough to have your account number, right? I'm gonna, I'll tell you what's best, you know? No, trust God like that. Believe in him. Trust him. Obey what he says. Believe in him. Don't just believe that. Because how many people do we know that say, yeah, I believe, I believe God. I believe in, oh yeah, well, he died, he suffered, he buried, he rose again. He loves you. I believe that. That, yeah, but do you believe in? Do you believe in him? Do you trust him? Are you obeying him? That's why here in English it doesn't come across, but whoever would believe in him, Believes, I'm sorry, whoever believes in him, whoever goes on believing in him, will not perish. So perish. Perish. Items that perish. You ever have any, we just said we have, we're giving out some food here that's non perishable. Well, items that are perishable, they're going to rot. They're not going to be good for anything but to be thrown out, right? Good for nothing. You won't be able to use them anymore. They're perished. They're perished. They rotted. They're of no, no use. You can't eat them. I beg to differ because I have pigs. Give them to me. You're, you're rotting food, and I'll, you know, I'll give them to my pigs, okay? Because they'll eat anything. Try not to give them too rotted of food, but they do. They eat anything. Perish. Utterly destroyed. Ruined. Ruined beyond repair. Once again, the tense here is this is something that is also in the future tense, and it's also a continuous, repeated action. We'll go on. There's those that in false religion will say, oh, well, Annihilated. I'll just be annihilated like a candle. You blow it out. It's done. I'll cease to exist. Not so bad. And you have friends that say that. Well, oh, well. So worst case scenario is I just don't exist anymore. I'll just go to sleep, and that's it. It'll be done with. It'll be over with. Wrong. Perish. Eternally perished, right? We talked about torment. We talked about fire yesterday, right, brother? We were, like, talking about all these things, that these are all the things, weeping and gnashing of teeth, right? This is... Perish. This is what this is saying here. Perish. We'll go on. Will not perish, but shall have eternal life. Life. Opposite of death, obviously. Opposite of death. Life. Continually, totally being used. Being useful. Going on with life. Life. Continuing to enjoy life eternally, everlasting, forever, and ever, and ever, right? Another one of those words that's, that's, that's continually going on and active. It's going to continue to go on. You're going to have life forever and ever and ever. Similar to believe. You have to believe forever and ever. You know, keep believing, right? And then you gotta, you'll have eternal life that goes on forever and ever. Contrasted with verse 18, where it talks about It says eternal right here. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Have. Have eternal life. It begins when you look to Jesus. You repent of your sins. You trust in Jesus. It begins. It begins now and then goes on and on and on. Have it. You could have it. You could have it today. You can know today that you're eternally secure, that you're saved. You can know today. You trust in Jesus, but you got to go on. Believing and believing. You could ha- but you could begin today. Today could be the day that you actually know that you have eternal life. You have it. It's began, right, when you believe, when you go on believing, right? It keeps going, but you, it starts. You could have it today. We could have it. We have it. 
You started the eternal life now that'll go on and on and on forever if you have put your faith in Jesus. Contrasted with verse 18, I meant to say, he who believes in him is not judged. He who is the not, does not believe has been judged. That also too can start immediately when you reject him. When you reject Jesus, it could start already. The judgment could already start. Similar to the eternal life could already begin, the judgment could already begin. Right there, that judgment. It's going to go on, right, to the day of judgment, right, the great white throne of judgment. It's going to go on, but it can go on. It, it could begin already when you refuse, when you say, no, thank you, God. I'm good. Right? We'll go on. Really important is four. Has anybody just even wanted to, wondered what it says there in four? For God. For God so loved. Well, Brother Martin read it in context earlier. For is the linking word. It's a linking word to what was said in the previous, in the previous verses, right? Remember, it's in context here, in the context of for. So it's a linking word. So, for God, so, I said it earlier, it's not so, you know, it's not for God so loved us. We already talked about the love of God. It's not that he so thought we were great. He so thought we were attractive, Right? That he had this such a feeling for us. No, it's, it wasn't that. It's better translated in the Greek as in this way. In this way. For, in this way. So something that was just said, now in this way. Verse 14 says, As so Moses, I'm sorry, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him will so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. For, in the same way, this is how God loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. That would be a better translation of it right there in the Greek. Look at it up yourself. Work it out yourself. 14 and 15. Why would he highlight these? Why would he highlight that about Moses being lifted up? Remember who he's talking to. He's talking to Nicodemus, a teacher. He was the teacher to the Jewish people, bless you, to the Jewish people at the time. He was the teacher. He knew, he knew exactly what, what, what Jesus was talking about when he talked about Moses being lifted up. And he would have thought about that. He would have known the context. All right. I believe verse 16 stops the conversation. And I believe verse 16 starts the commentary, back, back to the commentary of John, of what was just said between the conversation of Nicodemus. I know it's read in, all, in most of our Bibles. It's read in verse 16. I believe right there, is where John's commentary starts. I don't believe Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. First of all, in John, Jesus never calls himself begotten, the begotten son. He calls himself son of man, which is like in the previous verse, 13, 14. John calls him the beloved, like in chapter one. He calls him the beloved son. John calls him that. He hadn't died yet, so he hadn't been given up yet. So, this is John, like I said, talking to the believers, explaining more about what this conversation meant about Nicodemus and Jesus. So he's talking to Jesus. I'm sorry, he's talking to Nicodemus. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and he brings up this fact that Moses lifted up the serpent. This is the way to look at the sun and be lifted up. The sun's going to be lifted up, and that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. He's comparing that. What happened to Moses? He didn't have to explain what happened with Moses. He didn't have to explain to him because he was a teacher. He knew what happened to Moses. He knew exactly what happened to Moses, what happened with the serpent being lifted up. We got to look to it because we don't know exactly what happened. Um, so we have to look to it. So we're going to turn to Numbers real quick. Numbers 21. And we're going to look at what he's talking about here to Nicodemus. Numbers 21, verse 4. Now remember, God chose the people, Israel, he promised, made a problem, promised to Abraham Isaac and Jacob, that they would have descendants on and on and on. They would be light to the world. Because of, because of them, the whole world would look to God, their God, and we, would, we too, as Gentiles, by faith, be welcomed into that household of, the household of God as well. Right? That's what their plan was. They were in slavery in Egypt, the, the Israelites. Slavery in Egypt, you guys know the story. We've been going through it on Wednesdays, Exodus, or I have on Wednesdays. Went into the they, God delivered them for 400 years slavery in Egypt, delivered them out of Egypt, right? It's part of the sea, all these miracles, right? Provided uh, water from a rock, manna from heaven, all these miracles, and trying to teach them that I'm going to provide for you. Trust in me. 
depend on me. I'm pulling you out of Egypt, and I'm going to take you somewhere, right? I'm going to take you somewhere. Taking you to somewhere, what, a, a beautiful land, right? A land flowing with milk and honey. But you're going to go through this wilderness, right? This experience, and there's going to be, I mean, wilderness is going to be tough. It's going to be difficult. But if you remain in me, if you keep trusting in me, I'll protect you. I'll protect you from all the enemies that are around. I'll protect you. Remember that. I'll protect you. And time and time, the enemies, and when the people would, would God would allow it sometimes. He would allow it as, as, as a way of like punishing his people and showing them, teaching them discipline. He, he disciplines those he loves, and that's what he would do. He would allow these things to happen. Years and years later, he actually sends the Babylonians right, to overthrow his people. But here in Exodus, or Numbers, I should say, same story, the Exodus, basically coming out of the Exodus, going into the Promised Land. We have the story here of the bronze serpent. Verse 4 says, They set out from Mount Hor by way of the Red Sea to go around to the land of Edom, and the people became impatient because of the journey. They became impatient. The people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt? Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no food, no water. It wasn't true. But we loathe this miserable food. They said there's no food, but there was. They just loathed the midst of, they were complaining. They were ungrateful for the food that God did provide for them, right? They wanted to go back to Egypt and look at, oh man, but they had so much better things in Egypt, so much better food in Egypt. Oh man, I just want to go there and I want to just enjoy those things in Egypt. This is, I'm over this. This is boring. I'm impatient. They're impatient on this journey. So he's, this is a teaching that, that, that God's showing us right here, like, about impatience, about going to the wilderness and, and depending on God and trusting in, jo- in God and, and, and not growing weary. The Bible says in the New Testament to not grow weary in doing good. Keep going, right? What happened here? The story that New Testament, John 3, 14, 15, what did God do? It says here in verse 6, the Lord sent fiery serpents. The, 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 the Lord that we think about, God loving so much. He loves you so much. He loves his people so much. What did he do right here? The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned, praise the Lord for that, because we have spoken against the Lord and you. Intercede with the Lord. Thank God for Moses, right? A great intercessor, right? He interceded. Thank, thank, thank the Lord that, Jesus lives to intercede for us as well, right? Moses, awesome picture of Christ, constantly interceding for the people. He was a faithful man. He was. We, we read about him in Hebrews 11, triumphs of faith. He was like, you know what? I'd rather not even be in Pharaoh's household. I could have anything I want. I'd rather be with the slaves than to take part in the, the passing riches of Egypt. That's what, that's what we read about it in Hebrews 11. We talked about it on Wednesday. That's what Moses did. He was willing to take the reproach. Say, whatever, whatever it means by suffering, to go this way and not that way, he was willing to do it. And time and time again, Moses interceded for the people. In Exodus 32, oh, sorry, I didn't finish that. So Moses interceded for the people. The Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a, on a pole. And that shall come about that everyone who, who is bitten, when he looks at it, he will live. And Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, and it came about that, the, that, that if a serpent bit a man, if he looked at the bronze serpent, he would live. He would live. So we see here that God right here made a way. He made a way for the people. Did God take away the snakes? Right? He didn't. He made a way that people would be healed. Right? He made a way to show them that they need to trust in him. Right? There was nothing magical about the, the, the pole with the serpent on, the bronze serpent on it, anything. Something that was probably familiar to them for healing because Egypt practiced things like that, images of, of, of serpents for healing and things like that. So it might have been something that might have been familiar to them, but that wasn't. When we think about snakes, what do we think about? The snake from the beginning, right? The snake that when sin entered the world, the serpent came in. The serpent came in, right? Sin entered the world, right? So we start thinking about sin. People here said, we have sinned. We have sinned. Jesus says, get the serpent, make a bronze serpent, put it on a pole, or God said, and those who look at it, those who gaze at it, those who trust in me, what I'm saying, obey what I'm telling them to do, will be healed. They'll live, right? Because it was a command. The ones that did it, the ones that obeyed, were healed. The ones that looked at it. 
Exodus 32, another time that the Israelites really, really um, dropped the ball and sinned. The golden calf. Remember the golden calf. We talked about the golden calf on Wednesdays. This is what the all-loving God did right here for those who, who, who um, committed like great sin by making a God in their own image, a God that of their own understanding, putting their, by their works of their own hands, putting their gold together and building this, this, this golden calf, right? Why? Another reason. They became impatient. Moses went up to go, be, to go hear from God, some more from instructions from God. He was the mediator between God and the people, but he was taking too long. He was up there for 40 days, and they got impatient. And so they had a, this huge orgy, and they were like, let's make this thing and dance around it and do all these crazy things because they just got tired. They just got tired of being in the wilderness. They got tired. They longed for Egypt. They said, let's make an Egypt here in the wilderness, basically, and do the same things that they did there. We don't want to wait for God. It's taking too long. And it says here in, in Exodus 25 that Moses, um, Moses said, hey, you guys, Every, every, everybody who wants to be with the Lord, go on this side. Come to me. Those who don't, don't. And it says, hear that. And then he tells the people here. Moses stood at the gate, and it says, he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, every man put his sword upon his thigh and go back and forth the gate in the camp and kill every man, his brother, his friend, and his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did what Moses instructed, and 3,000 men died. 3,000 men were killed. Similar to that serpent story. So you see that here in verse 34. I'm sorry, in, in chapter 34. We'll get there on Wednesdays. Chapter 34, this is an awesome verse right here. So talking to the people, you know, Moses came down, broke the tablets, the Ten Commandments, but God replaces them because that's who he is. Verse 6 uh, in chapter 34 says, The Lord passed in front of him. The Lord said, or he proclaimed, The Lord God is compassionate. Gracious. This is what we, we, like, we hear. We hear, man, but the Lord is God. He's good. He's gracious. He's compassionate. He's slow to anger. Amen. Abounding in loving kindness and truth. Who keeps loving kindness for thousands. Who forgives iniquity, transgressions, and sin. But then the second part of that verse says, he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. And we say, man, that's the God of the Old Testament. Wow, we have Jesus. Now we have Jesus, the New Testament, right? It's new, but it's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. We have to remember that. We really do, right? We say, well, that was in the Old Testament. That was an angry God. But well, we have the same God. He's, he's angry. He's slow to anger. It says he's slow to anger. He's super patient. He's super patient. First, first Corinthians, because just to show that it's the same God right here in, the new, in our New Testament, it says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Talking about Israel, we just talked about, they came to the sea, part of the sea. We're all baptized into Moses in the cloud of the sea. They all ate the same, we all ate the same spiritual food. They all drank the same spiritual drink. They got water from a rock, and that rock was Christ. Praise the Lord. Never, nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased. This is Paul's teaching to the church in Corinth here, right? And it's applying, we could apply it for us, right? With most of them, God was not well pleased. Well, that was them. That's them, though. That's them. For they were laid low in the wilderness. But what does it say here in verse 6? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6. These things are examples for us, the church, so that we don't crave evil things as they also craved. Don't be idolaters. Don't put anything above God in your life as some of them were, and it was written. The people sat down to eat and drink, and they stood up to play. No, let's not act immorally, as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us not try the Lord. Let's not test the Lord. Like, oh, he's loving, he's good. He, he couldn't do that. That's the, that's the way he used to be. We have Jesus now. Nor let us test the Lord, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents nor grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. That's another story. Verse 11, he, Paul repeats it. Now these things happen to them as an example, and they are written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, because of that, 
Let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall, that he does not fall, that he goes on, that he goes on, goes on, goes on, and goes on, that he keeps trusting in the Lord, right? This is what he's like. Don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you that such is common to man, but God is faithful. Amen. God is faithful. He is absolutely faithful. He will not allow you be, to be tempted beyond what you are able. So does he take the temptations away? Did he take the snakes away? No, absolutely not. He didn't take the snakes away. It says here, he provides a way of escape. He provides a way of escape also, it says, that you will be able to endure it. And that's what he did. That's what God did at that time. He didn't take the snakes away. He provided a way of escape. That was the judgment. Snakes, that was the judgment, right? Because of the sin of unthankfulness, ungratitude. God judged because of of, of idolatry, trusting in anything else above God, ourselves, our achievements. The result, that's the problem, sin. Sin is the problem. Perfect representation of sin, the serpent. Sin entered the garden, certain... Genesis 3.15, God will crush the serpent. He'll bruise the, the child, but God will crush the serpent. But he will crush the serpent, his head. This was signifying that. Way back then, Nicodemus knew that story. When Nicodemus thinks about when, when Moses lifted up that thing, I think all that would have came back to him. When we think about that's a tragedy for his people. It's in, his, in his people's history, it's a tragedy. He would have thought, man, all those thousands of people died. God made a way with, with that. He wouldn't have done like, oh, man. That was awesome. What a loving story. I remember that story. Nicodemus is a teacher. He knew that. He wouldn't say, oh, man, I remember that story, Jesus. That was a great story. He would have thought, dang, thousands of people died? When we think of 9-11, what do we think of? The couple of people that survived, or we think of the thousands that died? When when Moses, I mean, sorry, when Nicodemus, when the people at Jesus' time thought about these, these things, whoa, they knew it all. They didn't have to be taught those things. We need to go to the Old Testament and read these things for ourselves. We really do. We can't be New Testament Christians. We need to go and really look at these things. Why? Because they are written for our example. So we don't go that direction, right? The whole counsel of God. I'm afraid there's a lot of churches that don't teach that. They really don't. There's, I, I've heard huge churches, huge pastors saying, like, the Old Testament's boring. It's not that important. It doesn't really apply too much to us now. Just the New Testament, right? And they might read it themselves because they want to know. They want to be able to teach and be able to, oh, this is what. But no, I encourage you guys, get into the Old Testament, Right, Get into the Old Testament, really. So God made a way. That was the solution to the problem. The problem was sin. God made a way. God made a way of escape. He made, that was the solution. He didn't take the snakes away. He made, a, he made a way of escape. The bronze serpent lifted up, represented Jesus on a stick, right? God made a way. God made a way. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf. Literally be sin on the cross on our behalf, right? So that he could die with sin and finally put sin to death, right? Put it to death. That those who would look on him, right? Just like they looked at the serpent. Those who would believe in him, trust in him, obey his word, that though they would be healed. They would be saved from the, from the serpent's bite, right? From the sin, the serpent's bite. 1 Corinthians 15, 55, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, but the power of sin is the law, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He takes away the sting. God takes away the sting. When you look to him for healing, when you gaze on him, and when you trust in him, and keep, don't look away, keep trusting in him, keep believing on him, there's victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. A similar verse to, for God so loved the world, this is what he did. This is how he loved the world, Romans 5.8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. He demonstrated his love. And while we were sinners, Christ died for us. I would say that's unconditional right there. He died for sins of the whole world unconditionally, right? Nobody did anything to earn him there. We weren't alive 2,000 years ago. So really, actually, physically, but like, no, nobody can earn that, right? We're saved by grace. Definitely unconditional that he did that. Another John 3.16, it's 1 John 3.16, the epistle. 
We know love by this. This is how we know love, that he laid his life down for us, that he laid his life down. This is how we know. Similar to what John 3.16, 1 John 3.16 says, this is how we know that love, right? That he laid his life down for us, and we ought to lay our lives down for the brethren, right? That's how we know love. It's doing something, agape, act, action. We ought to do the same thing. You love, you love your brothers? Do something for them. Meet a need. Meet a need. That's what God did. It says here, he loved, this is how we know his love. He laid his life, life down for us. We ought to lay our lives down for the brethren. How? By meeting a need. He met a need for us. We need to meet need for others. That's what it means to serve. That's what it means to serve, and it's a lifestyle, right? It's not just on Sundays. It's a lifestyle. Go on serving people, right? Serving people. Even our enemies. Even our enemies, so Nicodemus would have known these things. He would remember that tragedy. Jesus didn't tell Nicodemus. We, what did Jesus tell him? We'll go back to John. We're almost through. So Jesus is having this conversation with Nicodemus, the, the ruler, the te- or one of the rulers or, or teachers uh, 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 of the Jews. It says rulers of the Jews. It was the teacher, the, the, the top dog right here, the, the teacher. He knew these things. He knew stuff. But one thing he didn't know, he didn't really have a relationship with God. He went to Jesus because he really wanted to know he knew Jesus was, was who he said he was, but he's like, but he didn't know why. He didn't know how. He wanted to know more. He sought the Lord. He went to him and asked him, like, man, I'm a teacher, but I don't know these things. And Jesus told him, like, yeah, you're a teacher, and you don't know these things. He wasn't being sarcastic. He was just like, yeah. He tells him this. Jesus tells him, man, don't worry about it, Nicodemus. You're religious, man. You, 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 you're in the temple all the time. You, you, you do all these things. You, you teach the people. You do all this stuff. You you're, you're good. I love you, Nicodemus. Did Jesus tell him that? It's all right. You're good. You're a religious person. Just come as you are. You're good. Hey, Nicodemus, just accept me into your heart. It's okay. it's, you'll be all right. Did you tell him that? No, he tells him this. Remember about Moses? Remember about when you were lifted up? And then he would have just thought about all those things. He tells him, Nicodemus, you have to be born again. Nicodemus, you have to be old. This is an old Nicodemus. He's an older person. He's an older man. And he's like, and he's telling him, you have to be, and, and, and Nicodemus wasn't dumb. He wasn't saying like, he wasn't saying like, oh, how am I going to go into my mom's? It wasn't like that. He just like, how? Like, how? I'm old already. I'm, been, I'm a teacher. I'm like, how? Jesus is, is essentially telling him, you, you got to start over. You can't clean your act up. You got to start over. You have to be born from above, born of God. This is what he tells him. He talks to him about water and spirit. He says, unless one is born of water and spirit, he will not enter the kingdom of God. He tells him that. He tells Nicodemus, you have to be born again. He doesn't tell him how yet. Remember, verse 16 is John's commentary, I believe, is John's commentary to us about what just happened. I don't believe this is Jesus still talking about himself right here to Nicodemus. So he stops right there with that story about Moses and relating it to this is what you have to do. So he gets there, but he tells him, you must be born again. Look what happened over there with Moses. Look at all the thousands of people who died. What did they do? What was their way of escape? Obeying God by looking at that serpent on there. And in the same way, you must, the same way, look at the Son of Man. And whoever believes in him, whoever goes on believing him, whoever trusts him, right? Just the way the people trusted in that bronze serpent by God's command, he's telling Nicodemus the same thing, but he tells him all these things. You must be born again, Nicodemus. Look at what happened to these people, Nicodemus, right? You must be born of the Spirit. You have to trust in the Son of Man to be saved. Trust him, obey him, Nicodemus. He's talking to Nicodemus. He was. Fix your eyes on the Son of Man, Nicodemus. He was telling him. And John says, okay, just like that, in verse 16, for just in the same way, God the Father acted in love on this occasion. John's telling us, because it already had happened. John's writing it. It already had happened. John's teaching us now, telling us now, telling the church now. God the Father acted on one occasion This time for the whole rebellious human race, all of us, the whole rebellious human race, by sacrificing his only natural son so that all who go on trusting in him will never be ruined beyond recovery, but go on 
to have an everlasting and abundant life forever and ever and ever. Just in that same way. Like I said, just in that same way. This is what John's message to us. John 20, 31. John tells us in 20, 31. Why this was written, why he wrote this, why he wrote this, this right here. He says in, in John 20, 31, these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. He wrote these things, he wrote this to us, so we'd go on. So we would go on believing, we wouldn't turn back. We wouldn't turn back to Egypt like they did. We wouldn't long for Egypt like they did. We wouldn't make idols in our life and put other things in our heart that's above God that we would endure, right? We would endure. We'd be willing to, to suffer things. In this world, okay, I could do without that because I have greater riches ahead. John wrote these things so that we would go on believing in the, the only Son of God. Let's see. Thanks be to God for the Holy Spirit, right? That he sent us the helper. He sent us the helper, right? I won't get there yet, sorry. For God so loved the world, right? For God so loved the world. Everyone who believes in him, that goes on believing him, will never be utterly ruined. Ruined forever and destroyed forever, but would live forever. Would have an abundant life forever and ever and ever those who would go on believing. Verse 17, but God did not send the son into the world to judge the world. He really didn't. The woman caught in adultery, you know, God, they, they wanted, this, you know, who's going to stone him? Who's going to stone her? You know, and they wanted, wanted Jesus to do it. Basically, and he's like, hey, he says, he is without sin, cast the first stone, right? It was an act of love. Awesome. He did that. He could have, yeah. Yeah, but he's like, who? There's other, there's other one here that's guilty. Where's he at? Shouldn't he be getting stoned too? The ones that were with her. Things like that, you know, but he says, I, where are all your accusers? He tells her, no one's here to condemn you? He says, neither will I condemn you. And he tells her, now go and sin no more. He tells her, go and sin no more. That's how he, and you think of all the interactions he had with people, the rich young ruler. He, God knew, Jesus knew that this guy worshiped money, and he tells him, give it all up. Because he says, I'm doing all these things. The rich young ruler tells him, I'm, I've been doing all those since I was a kid. I don't murder people, I'm not a liar, I don't steal. I'm going to do those things. He's like, yeah, but there's still one thing. Sell everything you have. Give it up. Because he knew that was the one thing right there, Jesus. And it says the rich young ruler went away. It's like, discouraged. And Jesus didn't chase after him and say, wait, wait, I love you, though. I love you. Never mind. Just as you are, you're good. Jesus, that's not the way he did it. That's not the way even the the lame man that he was able to walk in the pools, remember? He gave him, walk. Get up, walk. Take up your mat and walk. And he, he restored to him. What did, he, what did he tell him? He sees him later on, and the guy's like, yeah, you know, I can walk, right? He says, yes, stop sinning. Otherwise, something worse is going to happen to you, Jesus tells him. What could be worse than where he was just at? He, eternity without God. Eternity without God. That's worse, right? That's worse. And he tells him, this is Jesus' interaction with people. And I'm telling you guys this because it's important for all of us Unbelievers, believers, it's all of us to continue to go on. Keep believing. Don't give up. There's going to be an apostasy where people are going to fall away, whether it's in their hearts, physically fall away, walk away. And God, and this is going to happen. The Bible talks about this. It's going to happen. The people that were going strong, right? How you finished, you started strong. You started strong, but finish stronger, right? It's not so much how you start, because we all screw up when we start. I know I did. First couple of years, it was like a, a newborn baby eating things off the ground that I shouldn't, you know, that I shouldn't, sticking things in my mouth that I shouldn't, doing things that I shouldn't, but then you have to go and keep going on and grow. The Bible talks so much about growing and going and maturing and moving on, keep going, right? Knowing the depth and the height and the breadth, we get to know more and more about God's love the closer you get to him. I said it earlier. We get to know that how much we don't deserve his love, right? It's like, man, and we love him even more because of it. We love him even more because of it. That he withheld that judgment on us when we looked at him. Right? Um, he did not send the world to judge the world so that the world, he came to save. But he who believes in him is not judged. 
who he does not believe him and has been judged already. So greatest sin is to say no thank you, to say no thank you, God. This offer today, if you don't know God today, if you're not born again, if, you don't, if you're not born again today, look at Jesus. Look at what he did for your sin. He nailed it to the cross. Like Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Without the Holy Spirit, you will no way see the kingdom of God. You just won't. There'll be an eternal damnation, perishing in hell. That's what it is. Hell, ooh, talk about hell. Where did you learn about hell from? Jesus. Jesus is the one who talked about hell in the New Testament. Oh, you're not being loving. Talking about hell. You said God so loved us. He wasn't being loving when he brought it up. You see, you got to understand the kindness and severity of God. We have to understand it. We have to get the right idea of who God is. It makes a world of difference in your life and the life of others. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son. No, thank you. I'm good. Verse 19, this judgment that, has, had that the light has come into the world. He did. He came into the world. The light came into the world. But men love darkness rather than the light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. If you're saying no thank you today, you might not realize this, but it says your deeds are evil. Evil. If you say no thank you to the light, it says, it says you love darkness rather than light. You're like, I'm not evil. I'm a good person. It's not what God teaches us by his word here. For everyone who does evil hates the light. Hates what do you mean hates? Everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But he who practices truth does come to the light. You want to practice truth? Come to the light. Jesus, God taught, says in James, draw near to him, he'll draw near to you. Right? It's as simple as that. Turn from your way and follow the way. We've been following our own way for too long. Are you tired of it? You tired of doing it your own way? Follow his way. It says here, um, that's what I was going to say. I mentioned earlier, we talked about it earlier. 3,000 people died when the law was given, when, God, when, when Moses went up, gave the commandments for his people, the good instructions for his people to live a good life, right? These are the instructions. But they said, no, nah, we're good. We're going to play. We're going to do all these things. We don't want that, right? 3,000 people died. Right? 3,000 people were slain. God said, you don't go kill them. That's God. He did that. Same time around, Pentecost is celebrated now. When the Holy Spirit was given, read it in Acts, 3,000 people lived. 3,000 people were saved. Right? 3,000 people lived. Praise the Lord for the Holy Spirit. Right? Praise the Lord that he went. Right? It says here in John 16, Jesus taught this, but I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. It's to your advantage that I go away. For if I don't go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, and he, talking about the Holy Spirit, when he comes, what will he do? What will he come do for the world? He will convict the world. The Holy Spirit, number one, will convict the world concerning sin, sin, Righteousness? Whose righteousness? God's righteousness. Man, God, you're so perfect. I just can't ever meet that. Exactly. But you're just so holy. I just can never. There's no way. Exactly. There is no way. Way. But the way. He's the only way. Right? And judgment. When he comes, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That there is a judgment. Jesus taught it. Told Nicodemus. Remember that. Remember what happened when God judged those thousand people who died? Remember when that happened, when God sent the snakes to bite all the people and they died? And he said, this is the way of escape. Trust in me. There is a judgment. It says, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me and concerning judgment because the ruler of the world has been judged. We have to understand the love of God in light of this. We do have to understand what he did for us rebellious, the rebellious people Fallen, the fallen world, we have to understand where we're at. We have to understand that if we don't love the light, if we don't want to come to the light, that our deeds are evil and they will be judged. God is righteous. He's a consuming fire. He's holy. He's perfect. He, but he will not 
just say, all right, you're good. Come as you are. Stay as you are. Absolutely not. We have to really believe to understand, begin to understand the love of God. We have to understand that we, are, we hate him. Our deeds are evil. Saying no thank you, not today, is one of the biggest things we could do. That just to say, to throw that in his face and say no thank you. We have to remember these things, you guys. We have to be, not be afraid and ask God for boldness so we could be able to speak the truth in love, that we could speak about sin. This is what the Holy Spirit came to do, to convict of sin. Well, we've got to bring it up. Jesus brought it up. We just talked about a few stories. Sin, and Jesus brought it up. We, we have to be willing to do that, right? We have to be willing to tell people that, that, that the fallen world is cut off from God, that he, it's not, he doesn't love you so, so, so much that he's willing to overlook sin. Absolutely not. That God is righteous, he's holy, he's perfect, and his standard is nothing short of that. We can never meet that standard unless someone stood in our place. And that's what Jesus did. He stood in our place. This one time he loved the world so much that God sent his son to take our sin on the cross and die for us and be sacrificed for us. That whoever would believe in him, would trust in him and obey him, would not go to hell, but would spend heaven with him for all eternity. Judgment has come for those who don't believe today. Judgment has already began. There's going to be a finite finality to that. There's going to be a finality to that. It's going to, it just starts right now today. If you, if, you reject, if you reject what Jesus has for you, it starts. The judgment has stopped because you don't walk in the light. You don't go to the light. The judgment has come. But not to those who complete, continue trusting in God. A person must be born again, born of the Spirit, by putting his faith by trusting in Jesus, God, by, by trusting in Jesus. You can't understand the love of God unless you understand what he delivered us from, that we are guilty, right? And that he took our place. I'm just going to leave you guys with this. I've heard it said like this before, okay? If you have not been born again, if you've not been born again, there's... There will come a day when you will wish that you have not been born at all. There will come a day when you wish you have not been born at all. Lord, help us. God, help us. Let's pray. (sighs) Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you. We bless you, Lord God, because you first loved us. And we know the way you loved us was by crushing your son, Lord God, for the forgiveness of sins, Lord God. That's what you did to make a way. You made a way of escape, Lord God, in your son. To all those who would believe in him, Lord God, who would go on believing him, would not perish, but have eternal life, Lord God. We need your help, Lord God, and thank, praise you, Lord God, for sending us your help, sending us your helper, your Holy Spirit, Lord God. We could receive him today, Lord God, to help us through this wilderness, Lord God. We could receive him today when we gaze at you, when we look to you, when we trust in you, Lord God, when we obey you, Lord God, when we do what you've asked us to do, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. We need your help because, Lord, our, fe- our flesh is willing, but the spirit is willing, but our flesh is weak, Lord God. Help us to crucify our flesh, Lord God. Help us to walk in the newness of life, Lord God. If those who don't know you, Lord God, that are hearing my voice right now, Lord God, it's about a relationship. Do you have a good relationship with, with the God of the universe? It could start today. Is your relationship with God not so great? Just repent and trust in him. Keep it simple. That's what Jesus taught. That's what the apostles taught. Repent and trust in him. Help us to do that, God. Continually, Lord God, please. We love you, Lord. We thank you. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. God bless you guys.